On this holy, special night, I would invite you to stand and join me for the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And now I would invite you to join me as we respond together as people of faith. Let's read together. Your glory shines around us, Lord. Your light banishes the darkness. We join the angels and all the heavenly host, worshiping you with songs of heartfelt praise. All creation shouts the good news of great joy. Chains are broken, burdens are lifted, wounds are healed. This is God's doing. Let the world rejoice in the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to say thanks to the Zaccarello family for uh, lighting the Christ candle. And, and really, I want to say thanks uh, for all those who have made this a very special and meaningful time. I mean, the musicians, the volunteers, the staff, uh, serving ministries, children's ministries. Stu- I mean, everybody is really pitched in, and this last month has been very meaningful. We've had a lot of great stuff going on throughout the month, not just in Sunday worship, uh, but in many other ways as well. So I really appreciate all that people have done and the ways that you have participated uh, in our ministries over the last month. So most of us know the anticipation of the birth of a child. One way or another, even if it's not within your family, you know someone, you've had a friend, you've had a relative, somebody's had a, you know what that feels like, that, that when you find out they're expecting a child, well, it, it kind of starts. And the first question is always, right, when's the due date? As if it's ever on the due date. But, you know, that kind of gives you a target. And so, you know, here's the frame of our anticipation. And, and so, you wait and you wait, and every time there's a doctor's visit, how'd it go? Right? And the anticipation just continues to build, and wow, you're at eight months, eight and a half. And then you get the news that she has gone into labor and gone to the hospital. And, uh, and oh, this is great, this is exciting, this could be three or four hours, this could be 30 hours. I mean, who knows? But man, it is pitched anticipation right now. And then finally, you get the text or the call or the whatever that says, baby's been born and it's a, a boy or a girl or, or twins or whatever. But you're still waiting. There's one more piece of news you want to hear, right? That mother and baby are fine. Man, then you can just kind of release it, and you're so excited, you're so happy at the birth of a baby, and you just feel so joyful. That is indeed good news. But most people don't have a birth announcement quite like this. With the angel, right? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Well, this is a widely used Scripture passage, of course, on uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, The notion of an angel pronouncing this to shepherds in the field. Uh, Indeed, great news that is intended to be joy to all people. I mean, not everybody took it that way. I mean, King Herod didn't take it that way. Um, later on in Jesus' life, certainly other people didn't think He was a gift to the world. And even after His resurrection, there were people who still doubted. So, not everybody has quite taken it that way, but it's available to us as good news for joy. I I won't belabor the point, but man, 2020 has been a year, right? Uh, It's been a year that uh, it's been interesting and it's been challenging There's been plenty of controversy about all kinds of things. There's been a lot of difficulty on a lot of different levels for a lot of different people. And certainly there's been a lot of tragedy. I mean, man, what a year. And yet, even in this year, 
You surely know somebody, you've been around somebody that's joyful. That still has a sense of joy. Really? I mean, don't you want to just go to them, say to them, really? Really, you feel joy? Look at what's going on. But they do. They have this sense, somehow this sense of joy. But, but you know people who, two people who can have a very, very similar experience in life, and one of them just becomes angry and bitter, and the other one seems to be at peace, and actually, even in the midst of their difficulty, seem to have some joy in their life. So what does it look like for good news to elicit joy? What might be some things for us to think about in, as we end 2020 and, and move into still an uncertain 2021? What does it look like to have joy in those moments? Well, I think first we know that joy is a choice. Joy is a choice. You've known people who have had very similar, different responses to the, to the same event. You might know the story of uh, Anthony Ray uh, Hinton, a uh, fairly well-publicized, well-known story. He spent 30 years on death row for a murder he did not commit. As a matter of fact, in the appeal process, it was found that, that he was at work in a locked factory when the crime occurred. He couldn't have done it. Matter of fact, when it went to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court unanimously, when does Supreme Court unanimous about anything? Unanimously threw out his conviction and said, get that man out of prison. So, of course, he was, he's been interviewed a lot of different times. Part of why he's been interviewed a lot of times is because of, his, because of the way he's approaching this, the way he views this. He says, if I'm angry and unforgiving, then they have taken the rest of my life. In another interview, he said, the world didn't give you your joy, and the world can't take it away. I refuse to let anyone take my joy. After 30 years on death row. Well, during this uh, month, we've been looking at some of the songs of Christmas and, and what the songs say, but also some of the stories behind the songs. Um, and, and one of those uh, that is a pretty popular Christmas song is, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. That's based on a poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a uh, well-known American poet, uh, middle 19th century. Uh, he wrote it in 1863. The preceding two years had been a rough two years. In 1861, his wife of 18 years, uh, whom he loved, was deeply devoted to her. Uh, she died after uh, uh, being burned in a house fire. About a year later, his oldest son went and joined the Union Army. He had no idea his son was going to do this, and his son didn't tell him and did not ask for his blessing. He just went and did it. And he didn't even know what had happened until he had received a letter that his son was gone and serving in the Union Army. Then, a few months later, that son was very, uh, very badly injured in war. He survived, but he was very badly injured. It had been a tough two years. And so, supposedly he's hearing bells ringing on Christmas Day, and he hears, and he, and he writes this poem. I'm not going to read the whole poem, just a few verses, but to show you this choice he made. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from the black accursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. I mean, that, the poem kind of starts with a place where things are good, and then it gets dark. And in the end, he chooses joy. Joy is a choice. Joy is also a practice, an intentional attitude and behavior. It is a practice. It's something that you do. We do this, especially with children this time of year or around a birthday or something, when someone gives a, a child a gift we often say, what do you say? 
right? And often the younger the child, the more silly we are. What do you say? Right? And they stare at you blankly like, I, 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 I got nothing. And so then we say, what do you say? And that word say becomes four syllables somehow, right? It's just the most, and, and so then, and then they're still not getting it. And so you say, say thank you. Finally, the kid gets it and says, thank you. And then you may have to say, no, look at Uncle Charlie to say thank you. Look at Aunt Sue, look at, you know, say. Now what we're doing in that moment is we're teaching gratitude. Gratitude is learned. It's not born in us. We learn gratitude. Hopefully we learn it early in life, but if we don't, we can learn it as life goes on. We learn gratitude. Now that's important. That's really important. Brene Brown, many of you have heard of Brene Brown, best-selling author, researcher, etc. She says, the relationship between joy and gratitude was one of the important things I found in my research. I wasn't expecting it. In my 12 years of research on 11,000 pieces of data, I did not interview one person who had described themselves as joyful who also did not actively practice gratitude. So what does it look like to practice gratitude? I mean, so gratitude and joy live together. It's not a first there's one, then the other. It's there, but they're, they're, they're together. And the more you practice gratitude, the more joy you have. It can be something as simple as Every, when you sit down to a meal, some families have a prayer before they eat. That's a great moment, before you pray. Okay, one thing everybody's grateful for. One thing. What is it? Even if you're by yourself, say it out loud. Right now, I am grateful for whatever. Whatever. And, and you know, if you have kids at the table, they may be you know, grateful that it didn't rain today. It could be that they're grateful that their big brother is not there tonight. He's spending the night with somebody else, and I finally have the house to myself. Okay, let them be grateful for that. That's fine. Whatever it is, to practice gratitude, which leads to joy. One of the, one of the hymns we often sing at Thanksgiving is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It's a poem by Henry Van Dyke, and he insisted that the poem be sung to Beethoven's Ode to Joy, a piece of music. And so it's just this exuberant praise of God, right? That's why we sing it at Thanksgiving. It's this praise of gratitude for what God has done. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee. God of glory, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. All Thy works with joy surround Thee. I mean, just this exuberant song of gratitude. Joyful, joyful. So joy is a choice. Joy is a practice. Joy is spiritual. Joy goes beyond our own lives. It's about something bigger and further than us. It's not just something right here. It's larger than that. I mean, right? That's what the Scripture, it's, it's an announcement. It's good news of great joy for all the people. The Messiah is born, the Savior of the world. This is something far beyond just me and my little reality. I mean, I think it's really important for us to, to think about that, to think about the enormity of that announcement, that the announcement was not that it's just the people who are right that will inherit the, the earth. It's not just the, the people who uh, think the right way are okay. It's not just for people who are in a particular political party people of a certain ideology, but good news for all the people. It's something beyond all of us. It's not something you and I control. It was an announcement of a gift. Just a gift. The angel saying, God is giving you a gift. Now, what we do with it is another matter. It's an announcement of a gift. It's spiritual. It's something beyond us. We don't create it. We didn't conjure it up. We can receive it. We can receive it. Well, one of the, uh, again, popular Christmas songs we, we will sing here in a few minutes is Joy to the World. Um, do you know that Joy to the World is, uh, was not originally a Christmas song? It's not. If you ever really read the words, I mean, as you read it, you'll think, well, okay, this doesn't say anything about the birth of Jesus. It doesn't say anything about the angels or the wise men or... It doesn't, because Isaac Watts wrote it in the early 18th century, and he wrote it based on Psalm 98. 
Psalm 98, which is another one of those just praise of God for God's creation and God's goodness, and that all of God's creation will praise God in gratitude. That's what Psalm 98 says. And so, somewhere along the way, though, it became associated with uh, Christmas. And um, so, we sing it that way. It is now the most published Christmas song in North America. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room in heaven and nature sing. Man, maybe that's where it became associated with Christmas, the notion of let every heart prepare room. Oh, they couldn't find room in the inn. I don't know. I don't know exactly how it worked. But somehow it became associated with Christmas, that it's something of joy beyond ourselves. So I want you to just take a moment and think of something, a time in your life where you had a great sense of joy. Whenever it was, whatever it was, some, a great sense of joy. Well, the fact that you can remember it means you still have that joy inside of you. And remembering it helps you practice it. A friend of mine had a very difficult uh, Christmas uh, many years ago now. He um, was going through a divorce and for the first time would not be able to be with his kids all of the, the Christmas. And so uh, he had, had them the first half of Christmas Day uh, and, then, and then took them back. And then uh, it was late afternoon and thought, well, what do I do now? And thought, you know, I'll just, I'll just, I'm going to go somewhere and eat an early dinner and then go back to my apartment. So he starts driving around. It's Christmas evening. And he starts looking for a place to eat. You ever look for a place to eat on Christmas night? Yeah, there's nothing, man. He said it finally dawned on him. He remembered Denny's. Denny's. Denny's is open year round, every day, all the time. Go to Denny's. So he goes to Denny's. Sure enough, they're open and they're relatively busy. But he gets seated right away. And, and while he's, uh, and, and the server comes over to him and he said, she just exuded joy. Now, not in the fake way. You know, the person, they just, boy, it's just a put on. It's, and you're like, oh, good grief. No, he said just, she was just genuinely, authentically a joyful person. And you could just see it. You could, you, just everything about her was like that. She, and she, took it. she was excellent. She was an excellent server. Everything she did was great. And it just, it just lifted his heart on a very difficult night. And so when she brought him his check, he, he thought about her working on Christmas night. He said, could I just say something real quick? And she said, well, of course you can. And he said, thank, first, thank you for working Christmas night. I'm sure you'd rather be somewhere, somewhere else than working Christmas night. Thank you for that. Secondly, thank you for your joy. Because some, for some of us, it's not a joyful night. And so thank you for your joy. That kind of helps me. And she said, she, he said she just smiled, this very genuine smile, and she said, you know, I just, every, people have to eat every night. I, people got to eat. And she said, it just makes me happy to serve people. And so I'm glad that I was able to serve you tonight. A moment of joy that was certainly beyond his circumstances. A moment of joy he didn't create. Moment of joy that still lives. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for uh, the gift of your Son. We're grateful for the good news. We're grateful for all these things because, God, we know that in that gift, you make our joy possible. In that gift, you make it possible to get through difficult times, difficult circumstances, crazy difficult years. You give us that ability. And so, God, we thank you for that, and we uh, look forward to grasping that joy more and more fully in the coming year. We thank you for the celebration we have at this time of the great good news that does bring joy to all the people of the birth of the Messiah, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.